What's up guys, Mike here, the Detroit Borg, checking out the HTC U Ultra. So the U Ultra replaces the HTC 10 from last year and is a significantly larger phone. Now this phone has been criticized a lot for not really offering anything new or interesting among flagship smartphones, but we're gonna go in depth and find out exactly what it has to offer. So before we take a close look at our very shiny, shiny phone, let's get to our accessories, uh, which does include a case, which is kind of handy. I wish more phones did this. Uh, so this will protect the phone from damage because again, this phone is all glass. So it's kind of nice that a case is thrown in here just to protect it and to provide some grip. It is a clear case, so at least you can see the phone through it. Also included here is our SIM ejection tool. Uh, at the bottom of the box, we'll find a microfiber cleaning cloth for cleaning our very glossy phone. And we get some of the most paperwork I've ever seen with a modern smartphone. So removing the tray at the bottom of the box is our essential accessories, which includes a very compact wall adapter. Now this is a USB type C device, so we do have quick charging here and we do get a compatible cable for that. Also included here is a set of USB-C headphones. So yes, you guess it, there is no headphone jack on this phone, so instead it connects via USB-C, which does have some benefits in terms of audio quality. Now these headphones do sound pretty decent. They do include an inline remote control and microphone, and we do have a set of ear gels for finding the right fit. One of the neat pieces of technology built into these headphones with this USB Type-C connector is that they can automatically calibrate to your ears. So all I have to do is plug them in, runs the calibration sequence, and you're good to go. No testing or listening required. This phone does represent a pretty big design change for HTC. They're trading that classic HTC all metal design for glass. So the overall look is similar to phones we've seen from Samsung, but the mirrored finish is really striking, especially with this blue color. Although mostly glass, the phone is framed in metal and it is tinted to the color of the glass. So it looks very nice and seamless. All the servicing is very smooth and rounded. So the phone feels fantastic to handle. And despite its size, it's very thin and light and easy to handle, which is probably due to to the smallish 3000 milliamp hour battery, which trims some weight. Now, regardless, glass is more slippery and fragile than metal, so this phone could definitely benefit from the included case. The right side of this phone has the volume rocker and a textured power button just below it, which makes it easy to tell it apart. On the top edge is the combination dual SIM and micro SD card tray, which does support 256 gig cards. At the bottom edge, we have a USB type C connector, which is reinforced with a wider metal frame. Also down here is a side facing loud loudspeaker, which works with the earpiece for full stereo sound. But unfortunately, the loudspeaker at the bottom is much louder than the one at the earpiece, which means stereo sound is quite off balance, so it doesn't sound quite right. Although not terrible and certainly functional, it's still a step back on the feature I really liked about their previous models. The capacitive home button once again integrates a fingerprint sensor that is generally fast and reliable, although it's a little small for the size of the bezel. It's surrounded by a set of backlit capacitive Android keys, which only light up when touched. Uh, but I recommend that you change this under settings so that they light when the screen is awake. Otherwise, it can be a guessing game to find out exactly where those buttons are because the touch targets are kind of small. Where HTC really doesn't disappoint here is the 12 megapixel camera on the back with an f1.8 aperture, optical image stabilization, and laser-assisted autofocusing. You also find that laser sensor just below the dual-tone LED flash. Although it comes with a big camera bulge, it does impress with a nice shallow depth of field and fast and accurate AF. Once again, HTC is calling this camera an ultra pixel camera because of the large 1.55 micron pixel sizes, which increases light sensitivity for excellent low light performance. This generally means that the camera produces excellent exposure for every shot. Even with plenty of light, this technology helps to bring up detail in shadows without overexposing everything else. Even more impressive is the 16 megapixel front facing camera, perhaps the best selfie camera I've ever tested with a huge sensor that lets tons of light in with a nice wide angle lens, which means it's easy to get a nice wide shot without having to hold the phone too far away from you. Unfortunately, if selfie video and blogging is important to you, this only records at 1080p with no 4K. The display in this case looks like it came right off an LG V20. So this is a 5.7 inch LCD IPS display, which the ACC is calling a Super LCD 5 screen. Now it's a great looking quad AC screen with a resolution of 1440 by 2560 for a pixel density of 513 PPI. But just like the LG V20, the secondary display at the top adds an additional resolution of 160 by 1040 and is used as a dedicated space for a variety of software features and notifications. This display does have a few few faults common to LCD screens. Some of the backlight bleeds, which tends to look a little more uneven around the secondary display, but most people really won't notice this unless looking at a dark screen. Overall, it's a very vibrant display with noticeably rich colors, but not especially bright.
bright, which may have something to do with the relatively small size of the battery. The phone is powered by some familiar names, a Snapdragon 821 quad-core with an Adreno 530 GPU, so performance is at the top end for early 2017. 4 gigs of RAM and 64 or 128 gigs of internal storage round out the very respectable spec sheet. So compared to the previous model, which was powered by a Snapdragon 820, we're seeing pretty modest gains here on our Geekbench scores, and overall performance is excellent with this hardware. This phone doesn't really have any sort of water resistance rating, so it's not recommended to get wet. And despite its glass design, it also doesn't offer wireless charging, although that's pretty much unique to Samsung phones only at this time. Most phones of this size have a battery that's around 3,500 milliamp hours, so this 3,000 milliamp hour battery is kind of small, but I was able to get at least a full day out of this phone on a regular basis with no problems. That's probably thanks to the more efficient Snapdragon 821 CPU and the slightly dimmer display. Now there's no getting around the fact that this is the largest phone I've reviewed in many years. It's actually bigger than the Nexus 6, uh, which actually had a larger display. So for its screen size, it has a huge footprint, and that's thanks to larger bezels. But because it's so thin and light, it doesn't feel as big as its footprint suggests. So one of the things on the lock screen is the secondary display, which you can wake up by double tapping on it or just lifting up the phone. But this display also shows you your notifications. So they flash in the space instead of lighting up the entire display, which conserves battery life. We can also swipe across on this to get to our quick toggles for things like our Wi-Fi, sound profile, and more. We can also turn on the camera really quickly so you have quick access to the camera. It's not the quickest launch out there, but it gets the job done. There's a few other things here as well. So if we swipe again, you'll see your calendar events and some of your reminders. But of course, you can bypass all of this just by unlocking with your fingerprint sensor. So you just tap your finger to it, wakes right to the home screen, so it's very quick. Now, if we double tap on the lock screen, this wakes it up so we can see our notifications, the weather information, date and time, and that sort of thing. We also have quick access to our dock items. So this is what actually appears on the home screen as well. So if you want to quickly launch into any one of these apps, just swipe up on them, and then you have to unlock. This launches directly into the app. Now, there are quite a few gestures on this device, so we can double tap to wake up the lock screen we can swipe to the right and if we unlock here this will take us directly to blink feed if we swipe to the left you'll get a little vibration to let you know when it's happened we can unlock and that'll take us directly to the home screen we can also swipe down twice to quickly activate the camera app or better yet just double tap the power button to launch into the camera now all of these can be turned off under settings and it's kind of buried here so we'll have to go to our display gestures and buttons and go all the way down to motion launch gestures and you'll see them all here. So once the device is unlocked we do get a few additional features on the secondary display and that includes our music player. We also have our weather information in addition to our favorite apps. So we can add our favorite apps up here to get the secondary launcher that's easy to access. So for example you can go ahead and add Chrome or any app that you have installed. We also have our reminders in addition to our calendar events and our favorite contacts. You can add additional contacts to this list from our existing contact list. Of course, you can edit the secondary display by going to our secondary display settings panel. So going down here, you can see we can turn off active when the main display is on. So if you just want to completely turn this off, you can. And you can also turn this off so it's not active when the display is off. So if you just want to completely turn this off, you can. But we can modify its information here. So we can rearrange them if we want. We can unselect them if we don't want it. So for example, I don't really need my contacts up there so I can uncheck that. We also have similar controls for the locked display. So again, you can rearrange them or uncheck them, but we can also change the timeout as well. Now, unlike the LG V20, apps do not take advantage of that display. So with the LG V20, this display is used for some of the camera controls. So that's not used in this case. So this is Android 7.0, so if you tap and hold, Assistant. You get Google That's Assistant, and of course it talks right back to you. Swiping down on our notification shade, of course, we can expand them out like so. And then we have lots of quick setting toggles up top, which we can swipe through. So nothing terribly interesting here, but we do have Extreme Saver, so you can activate Extreme Saver mode. So if we click OK, you can see exactly what it does. So it really simplifies the interface, dims it down considerably, removes the color and the graphics to extend the battery life to its maximum potential. This phone does get a night mode, so it strips away the blue light 
light so it's less fatiguing on the eye, especially in evening hours, and you can modify the settings for this by tapping and holding on it. So you can change the intensity here just by dragging and dropping the slider, and you can also change the schedule. So personally, I set it for sunset to sunrise so it automatically kicks in. So digging through the home screens, if we swipe all the way to the right, we get to our very familiar blink feed. We've seen this for years with HTC. So this aggregates our social media feeds and any news we've added to it. So you can edit this as well, so you can see when you swipe down this updates, but if you go up here, you can tap on this and change what is highlighted. You can also see the services that plug into this, so you can see Facebook is one of them. So if you go up to this plus sign, this is where you can actually add some of the content that's linked to the service, such as Twitter, Vimeo, and more. Now personally, I actually really like Blink Feed, but if you don't want it, you can swipe and pinch to eliminate it. So we're gonna go up to edit here, and then we're just gonna go ahead and remove this page, and then it's gone. So if you wanna restore it, you can go ahead and hit plus to bring it back. Now just getting back to that editor, this is where you can drag and drop your home screen. So if you wanna rearrange them, you can, or just remove them, or set one home screen as the main home screen. In terms of what we have down here, we have our widgets, apps, and shortcuts. In terms of shortcuts, these are quick actions. So this will jump right to specific areas of an app. Now if we tap and hold on the home screen, we get to a different type of editor. So this includes our themes, and there are tons of them. So you can download new themes, change them up with different icon packs, keyboards, and more. Getting to the app drawer, very nicely arranged here. We do have some items and folders already and you can swipe between these vertical pages but of course we have options up here so we can show or hide apps so if you want to hide some of these apps instead of uninstalling them you can do that we can also rearrange apps so if you want to folder them that's how you do it right here so for example if I want to hide this under Google I can go ahead and drop it there we can also change the grid size so 4x5 is default but if you want to space it out more you have 3x4 you can also change the wallpaper for the app drawer so if you want something different than the home screen you can go ahead and select that click apply and then if we go to the app drawer now, you should see that right there. Now something I wish all app drawers would include is a quick shortcut at the top for the Google Play Store. Since we have Android 7.0, we do have side-by-side -side windowing, so if we open up one app, we can tap and hold the Recent Apps button to activate side-by-side -side windowing. So the first app is halved, and then we can go ahead and open up one of the apps we've recently accessed. So for example, we can go to the Photos app here and then navigate through the Photos app and Chrome at the same time. We can also activate this from the Recent Apps viewer. So for example, we can go ahead and drag Chrome to the top of the window and it should snap into place like so and then we can go ahead and select one of the other recently accessed apps. Now we can always learn something new from the settings panel so if we jump to that you can see that this is Android 7 so we have our slide in settings screen along the left side here and then we have all these settings with their descriptions just below it. Up top we have some suggestions including the HTC Sense companion. So basically this is keeping track of all of your activity and then will notify you of pertinent information. So for example if you go to work it's going to remind you of your commute time and suggest alternative routes if something's gone on or if you're exercising this will keep track of that data and of course you do have to give it permissions in order to keep track of this and you can see that all right here now all of that should appear within the notification shade in fact most of the time you'll see it fill up the second screen or you'll see them at the bottom of the notification list right now I have nothing so yes it's pretty much an alternative to the Google Assistant in terms of our settings a few things that stand out include HTC connect we've seen this before but this allows us to quickly connect to Bluetooth devices, DLA devices, or whatever is available on our nearby network. So for example, my monitor right here, Bluetooth monitor, this allows me to connect directly to that and output audio. In fact, I just got a notification on my display that I'm currently paired to it, so that is really easy. So always my favorite part of any interface is display gestures and buttons. This is where you can customize a lot of the interface. A feature we have seen before but haven't seen in a while is glove mode. So this increases the sensitivity of the display so you can use this with gloved hands. Now we can change the default screen size. So you can adjust this if you want smaller text or bigger text you can go with that or I'm just going to leave it to default. We also have our color temperature. Now this is different than night mode but you can warm up the display if you want something a bit warmer or more blue. Now as somebody who reviews a lot of smartphones it's pretty easy for me to say this is just an amalgamation of other smartphones. It gives up on some HTC design DNA and features that we've come to love and produces something that could be branded anything else besides HTC. Uh, but it's still a solid phone overall and uh, if you're a fan of ECC or if you have to buy another ECC phone, this phone has a lot going for it and it's definitely worth your consideration. But for me, it definitely doesn't stand out in a very crowded market. All right, you guys, hope so you enjoyed this look at the HTC U Ultra. If you did, please give this video a thumbs up to let me know. And I'll see you again in my next video.